Now, I can't say this is going to be an exciting one. This is just simple principles of order. Uh, but I want to continue on. I'm also studying the timeline uh, just so that you're aware of uh, Moses as it pertains to the Egyptian gods because I think that the measurement is something that we should really take a look at uh, to see what was going on in Egypt at the time. Uh, but that's a different thing. Hello, everybody. Uh, once again, to my grandchildren, and my brothers and sisters in Kenya, and if this is a blessing to you, then so be it. Uh, we're going uh, through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, picking up some of the principal statutes of the kingdom of God and how, we, and how the kingdom operates. And uh, because the goal is to reflect the lifestyle of our Savior, uh, me personally, I'm a born-again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking Christian. I believe in Christianity. Uh, not because Christianity is the quote-unquote great religion, but I believe Jesus operated the kingdom of God, and I think he's a great mentor. Uh, he is the son of God. I hope you hear my words. He is the son of God, and so am I. Um, no one enters the kingdom except by him which simply means uh, you cannot enter the kingdom any other way but by the kingdom of God. Jesus is my Lord, my boss, the one mentor who is my savior, deliverer by showing me how to operate in this kingdom. Jesus makes intercession that which walked out the kingdom of God perfectly for me as my Jetna, as my brother, uh, and sits at the right hand side of the Father who created this system of operating. Now, I may say these things a different way than you have or do. But the overall goal is to change my life from when I first got started, before I started studying the Word of God, which I've been doing since I, I don't remember dates. I always admire those people who can remember the dates and times of their conversion. Uh, the time of my conversion was as a child when my grandmother had me baptized and I came up from the water different. And I knew I did. I, I just I felt different. There's something about the renewal of being baptized. Um, but he became my Lord. That's when he became my Savior, but became my Lord. I, I, I got on my knees at a church called Cottonwood Christian Center at the time, which is now called Cottonwood Church, in a meeting with a, a brother. I can see his face. I forgot his name. I lifted up my arms and made a declaration that I wanted to live by this. And it has been a growth for me ever since. And that's been 30 years. I'm in Leviticus chapter 19 right now, and I want to read this and give you some commentary on it. This would be a short video in relationship to some of the other videos. We'll do a couple of uh, videos on 19. 19 verse 1, Leviticus. 
And the Lord spoke unto Moses, or spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel, and say unto them, Ye shall be holy. That's the word I forgot to look up. Ye shall be holy for the Lord, for I, the Lord, your God, holy. Um, verse 3, ye shall fear every man his mother and his father and keep my Sabbaths. I, Lord, your God. Uh, the first thing I want to point out is the holy part, and, and we, we know this. I keep looking this word up as though I don't understand the word, but, you know, you get something different all the time. Uh, it's to be separate, set apart, or sacred. And I think when we think holy, I think we, we, we want to project perfection, and I don't believe that's what holiness is. Just looking at some of the forefathers, some of the people in the 66 books of the Bible, and as I look at all of them as jetnas and mentors, you know, like Paul, David, um, any of them. Um, Jesus, of course, Adam, Noah, Abraham, uh, Malachi, so many, Samuel. I don't think the, the, the goal was perfection. Samuel even had problems with his two sons, just as uh, Aaron had problems with two out of his four sons. So operating in perfection is not the goal here. No, I think being set apart is to be set apart to operate according to these principles, learning them, operating them, come hell or high water, standing for something. Standing for something greater than yourself. To be set apart to live according to these principles. You shall fear every man his mother. And I think this word fear, um, I think this is a, a goes back to reverence. Uh, to fear every man his mother and his father. And I think that has to do with legacy. I talk to you very plainly about the legacy of my mother. I don't know much about my father, which is the reason why I don't talk about my father. But my mother did everything she could to raise a child as a single parent. Uh, and, you know, a country girl going up to Chicago from Mississippi to Chicago and, and the, the complete lifestyle changes that she had to live um, with a child. I was born in Chicago in 1966. And uh, respecting her legacy, I think, is... Uh, what I have to do. So I have, to, I think I have the responsibility to respect the legacy of my grandmother, uh, my grandfather I met for a time before he passed away. I think I spent about a year with him. He, he slept right next to me, my grandmother on, on my grandfather on my mother's side. And understanding um, some of the rights and wrongs of those generations so that you know, I can make changes in my generations, my generation, to be someone that uh, moves our family forward. I take that very seriously, which is the reason why I do some of the things that I do. That's my motivation, is to improve on uh, that which I came from. So when I think about fearing every man, his mother and his father, and keeping the Sabbaths, well, fearing every man, his mother and his father, that is, uh, I believe that that's, my, that's what I get out of it. The, the responsibility not to blame or put too much um, you know, I tell my daughter this, don't have too many highs, don't have too many lows, do the best you can just to stay even. 
Uh, of course, we have our emotions, our mind, our will, our emotions, but I think emotions are good for certain things. I don't think emotions are good for other things. I think we make bad decisions, we make decisions based upon our emotions. So when I think about fearing my mom and my dad, I think of my responsibility to move their legacy forward. When, when we talk about keeping the Sabbaths, I, it, it's really a simple word, and that word is rest. These are, again, these are just principles to stay in order. There needs to be a day of rest. Now, the Sabbath historically is a Saturday, not a Sunday. It's a Saturday. So the question be is, do we rest on Saturdays? Uh, out of respect for the reality of how this is written? Or do we just choose a day and make sure that we spend a day resting? Uh, I'm not sure how you see it. I'm working to spend Saturdays doing nothing other than study and resting. Uh, not doing any kind of work on Saturday. I think the beginning of the week is today, which is a Sunday. And so I think doing work on a Sunday is good. Verse 4, Turn ye not unto idols, nor make to yourself molten gods. I, the Lord your God. This is crucial, and I think this is a big problem in society today. We don't understand that I think I think we don't understand that we get attached to our molten images. Our molten in, in, uh, images can be cars, um, houses. Now it, it speaks specifically about metal, which is a material. But we have a we have a, a habit of pouring libation, which is another part of this definition, pouring out libations for our things. I think in the grand scheme of things, you know, we may not make a molten image of a face and want to call him Jesus, which some do, or Mother Mary, or the patron saint, this person or that person, but Oftentimes we make molten images or we buy molten images of things that we worship to the degree where we're willing to go above board to have these things in our lives. I have done these things. Now I'm not saying that that's for everyone, but I am saying that we're talking about simple principles of order. Nothing wrong with having things as long as the things don't have you. I personally think that when you turn not unto idols nor make to yourselves molten gods, I think that that's what it's talking about. Simply. Verse 5, And if ye offer a sacrifice of peace offerings unto the Lord, ye shall offer it at your own will, now, I like this part, so let me keep reading. Verse 6, If it shall be eaten the same day you offer it, and on the morrow, and if aught remain until the third day, it shall be burned in the fire. Verse 7, And if it be eaten on the third day, it abominable, it shall not be accepted. Therefore, that eat it shall bear his iniquity because he hath profaned the hollow thing of the Lord and the soul shall be cut off from among his people. Now I'm going to say something and this may not ring true to you, but I, man, I've been reading this stuff for so many years and I've, I've failed to comment on it because the way I see these things are just so simple, I believe that I don't think we get it. Have you ever gone over to someone's house, had dinner, and they served you leftovers that are three days old? And if that be the case, 
Have you ever gone back to have dinner with them again? <laughs> I don't think this is supposed to be read in a deep fashion. We we broke down the peace offering and I've, and, I've, and I've said this over and over again, and I hope it's received or studied at least, that reading this from the perspective of us all being the children of Israel, we're not even talking about sonship yet. We're talking about us all being children of Israel, and we're all called to the priesthood. And this is clearly saying that the peace offering is to be eaten eaten by the priest. Now, keep in mind the first two ver uh, the first the second verse of this said, speak unto the congregation of the children of Israel. He's not talking to Aaron and his two sons. Now, the peace offering is to be brought to the priest. So is it a contradiction? And the answer is no. The ch one thing we've gotten away from here in the year 2023, and at least, let me say it like this, I've gotten away from. I'm not saying everyone isn't like this. It's like this. I've gotten away from. My family has gotten away from. Is that the families used to come together. When I say families, I'm not just talking about one family with all of its members. I'm talking about Grandma used to cook, and all the neighbors would come by and eat. In fact, part of the cook, part of the experience was the women getting together and cooking together, the men barbecuing, and 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 and. Now we don't call this a peace offering. We like to call things today Thanksgiving, Christmas dinner. Easter dinner. It's, it's, these are simple principles of the children of Israel coming together, all the families, and eating. Not eating something that's two and three days old, but coming together and sharing resources. What's even more interesting is that it's, 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 it played out all through the New Testament as well. Again, it wasn't called Thanksgiving dinner, Easter, and all this other stuff. It was just Jesus feeding the 5,000, 4,000, or 3,000, or something like that. Forget the two stories. In Acts chapter 1, verse uh, them all coming together, verse in, in Acts chapter 2, going from house to house. The principles never stopped they look different in the Hebrew house as, than they did in the Greek Roman culture but the principles are the same in the African American community or the black community or the Negro com community whatever, whatever era you're in here in America uh, these were principles that were innate in us we didn't have the best of the best, so we ate net bones, we ate chitlins, uh, we ate pig's feet, and we all came together and enjoyed meals together. These principles of living as a community are deeply rooted in the kingdom of God. And what I'm hoping is you, my grandchildren, my brothers and sisters in Kenya will not allow people to come in and divide you, but you will have an appreciation of the kingdom principles, which brings us unity and prosperity and legacy. <laughs>